couldn't see him anywhere within 100 kilometers of here, um, studying, measuring, lobbying, I won't talk about it, lobbying, lobbying and doing other things in the forest. Um, and now he's going to share with us. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, everyone. I'd love to join you. I'm here to celebrate our place, our time, and us all. I recognise that we're pretty much in the middle of the Kumbangir Nation. And it's the greatest of delights to work with the Gumbangia people together as a community for the well-being of country and culture in the future. And I pay my deepest of respect to all Gumbangia people. And I recognise, as I almost always do, that this is a place of plenty. This is a place of purity and this is a place of antiquity. And the Gumbangia people for tens of thousands of years maintained this place. And we're now all the beneficiaries of that and the shared custodians of this most remarkable place on earth. I recognise as well that within the Gumbangia Nation are places that extend well back before the dreaming. And I recognise that the Talibu tree, which is the favourite food of the Dungir, the first fossils of that are in South America, 50 plus million years ago. And I recognise that the Dungir the one species that we now have, Fasciolatus cinereus or cinereus, is the end of a lineage, and that there were many more koalas over some tens of millions of years, and that there were fossils of that through various deposits around Australia, including the rivers we well heritage site. So for tens of millions of years, the Dungir has been dwelling in these most ancient of forests, these mosaics of rainforest and tall eucalypt forest and dry eucalypt forests on the ridges. And within the Gumbangi Nation, which is entirely contained within the Great Koala National Park, are literally the most diverse eucalypt forests on Earth. They are the richest expressions of evolution anywhere across space or time when it comes to eucalypts, and the species within the forest, the greater gliders, the yellow belly gliders, the quolls, the glossy black cockatoos, we're in the very centre of that. And that's a remarkable privilege. And I'd like to share something that was told to me a couple of days ago. I had a wonderful conversation with Gregory and Georgia, with the filmmakers. And I've been interacting with them a bit over time. And we spoke about today and what they would really like to see from today. And both of them, they, Gregory kind of took the call and it was a bit before he put it on speaker and we all spoke, the three of us spoke. And both Gregory and Georgia were most emphatic in saying that we, our community in the Mid-North Coast, in the Great Koala National Park, is leading the world in efforts to conserve koalas. And I'd like to take great pride and strength from that. And I'd like to put forward an important vision for where we go now with these globally significant forests. The Great Koala National Park came along 14, 13 years ago. It was developed by a wonderful gentleman called Ashley Love who we consider the godfather of the Great Koala National Park. And it was designed to give a future to the world's biggest koala populations, from Uruguay National Park to the eastern rim of the Guy Fawkes Gorges, through the New England wilderness, out through the Maclay River and to the north bank of the, the, the northern floodplain of the Maclay River. So that's all Gumbangia country. To the north is a bit of Yale, to the west is a bit of uh, Anawan country, and to the south is a reasonable chunk of Dungadi country. And what we all now need to do is to ensure that every single publicly owned native tree within that broad outline remains standing. And where forests are degraded by ongoing logging, weeds, fire, bell miner dieback, we need to do the best that we can to fix up these forests and we need to urgently put in place 
revegetation, for example, between Kotsaba and Ballingen and Ballingen and Yuranga, in places that are fertile and lush and flat, where we know the most dense koala populations are. We can do that. We have the money. We're the wealthiest nation on earth, essentially. We have the know-how. We know how to do that. And we certainly have the will within our community, and that's a dominant will. And we can do that, and we must do that, and we will do that. And now I want to celebrate many of the things that have gone on within our focus that bring us to the present day. Firstly, I want to celebrate the success to the present day of ensuring that no industrial logging whatsoever has been done in the Kalang headwaters, in the Bellinger headwaters, and in the Nambucca headwaters. And that is a momentous accomplishment that extends back five, six or more years. And the only reason that that has come about is because of dogged persistence to protect place. And within that is a lesson for us all and a motivator for us all that people power matters. People doing things can make sure that forests remain standing. Of course, all of our water supply comes out of these forests and we need the forest to remain standing to hold water at the top of the catchment, to let it flow a bit like a tank, to make it rain, and to keep our region moist because we're one of the wettest parts in Australia and our forests literally maintain that moisture. There's a self-sustaining function in our forests that for tens of millions of years, and in certain respects over a hundred million years, this region has been wet. That's astonishing. That's one of the most unique places on earth for that. And the Kalang headwaters is a place of absolute wonder. The pristine waters, the astonishing wildlife and flora within those forests. It's not particularly well known because it's bloody hard to get around. And the government didn't think there were many koalas there or greater gliders because it's so hard to get to. And for quite some time with the Biodiversity Embassy, we did the work. We found the koalas, we found the quolls, we found the pobaroos, we found the greater gliders. And that gave um, weight and motivation and inspiration to pretty much all forest campaigns thereafter. And to be honest, I think we're pretty close, if not over the line, in ensuring a future for the Kalang headwaters and the tops of all of our rivers. I think we've put enough effort collectively as a community and that the politicians have listened when they haven't listened to much else and that it is over the line. But still, vigilance must remain and we can't rest on our laurels. I'd like to celebrate now a truly astonishing human movement that commenced this year. And I'd like to celebrate Clouds Creek, compartments 49 to 55. And a bit like where we began in the Kalang headwaters, we're at 4.30 in the morning. I think it was April, it could have been May 2019. We were blocking the road. And Bainey, who lives up at Boggy Creek, was gobsmacked that people were in the road. What the hell is going on here? That's what it took. And starting on January the 8th this year, we did the same. I was in that greater glider head that you might have seen around. It looks like a pretty weird rodent, but standing from about 3.30 in the middle of the road because we knew that the Forestry Corporation was coming to attempt to commence the second biggest block of logging of native forests ever undertaken in northern New South Wales. And I want to pay my deepest and eternal respect to two people who are here in the crowd and one who's not. And those people are Meredith and Rona and Barry. And if it wasn't for the immense sacrifices and the daily tireless and indefatigable efforts of these truly remarkable people, we wouldn't have a forest. And you know what, we're at 165 days, I think it is. The what? second biggest forest that's ever been attempted to be logged in northern New South Wales remains standing. These are remarkable stories of humanity acting for its own well-being. We are 
for us, for us, Sarah. We cannot separate ourselves from the fabric of life. And I ever love listening to Uncle Miklo with his incredible stories about place. I'd like to talk about a couple of other places as well. I'd like to talk about what we quickly did at Gladstone, 10 minutes out of town. I had a call some months ago from Kev Doyle, who lives right next door to Gladstone. Most of you would know Kev Doyle, he owns Kombu. They've lived there for 20 whatever years. Kev was really worried because they'd had a letter from the forestry saying that they're coming in. I went out under the cover of darkness and bit of arvo. I documented and filmed a uh, calling of the yellow belly glider, which is an astonishing large gliding possum. Um, I was gobsmacked that it was there because it had become almost extinct from everywhere around here where they were now. This is 10 minutes outside of town, lower mid Calais. And then we went out the next week and we heard some more, but the people who were with me were talking too loudly and I couldn't record it. But I certainly heard them. All this goes to that we can step up and we can act for the forest, we can be a conduit for the forest. And some weeks after we found the Yellow Belly Glides, and there's koalas everywhere. Those forests are riddled with koalas. They're some of the most significant high density koala populations on earth. Hadn't been much work done, once again, too steep for people to get out, but now the science is in. The drone surveys that have been commissioned by the New South Wales government, there's in the order of 180 sites that have been done. And they've told us, and we're hearing from inside of government, that these amazing, and you saw the thermal drone on the, on the film, that everywhere where forests are intact, within the Great Koala National Park, the koalas are being found, the greater gliders are being found, and in a, a handful of sites, yellow belly gliders are still being found. And those areas that have been logged, that are being logged, or that have been logged and burned, they're not there. And that work was commissioned by Penny Sharp. It was endorsed by every single agency and their representatives. So Penny Sharp, our environment minister, is in possession of irrefutable evidence and advice now that logging reduces and in places extirpates, gets rid of koalas, and in particular, greater gliders. And what we did at Clouds Creek was to declare the Clouds Creek Greater Glider Sanctuary, because I think we're now 47 or 48 animals, 48 us, zero forestry. And everywhere where we go and we do this work, we find stuff that forestry just doesn't find. They can't be bothered looking. They don't care. We do. So our functions are critical to be in the forest, to document what's in the forest, to collate it, to capture evidence of it, and to step up for forests. And I celebrate in conclusion, I suspect I've probably done that. <laughs> um, I celebrate Pine Creek and the blockade camp that continues to operate. <laughs> I grew up at Bonville. I spent 13 years of my childhood there. I acted with my community as a teenager to create what's now Bonville Bonville National Park. And we protected a whole lot of plantations within it. There's heaps of plantations there. We've got form as a community in acting for the protection of all forest cover, for the benefit and well-being of our globally significant species and for our, ourselves, because these are all our life support systems. So between here and Coffs Harbour are many hundreds of koalas. We know the evidence is clear that we now have the biggest coastal koala colony in the state and one of the biggest koala colonies on Earth. And if it wasn't for the very timely and strategically planned and continuing efforts of community members to hold place, to hold a line at Pine Creek, we would have had heaps of koala deaths by now because all the indications were that the Forestry Corporation of New South Wales sought to get in there by about June or thereabouts. They haven't gone near it and there's vigilance and there's preparations and I'd encourage each and every one of you to do 
anything that you possibly can to act for folks. Because that is what we need to do to make sure that our forests remain standing. Acting together with the shared vision of keeping every single publicly owned native tree from the Guy Fawkes Gorges to uh, Urugi National Park, down the coast to the mouth of the Maclay River and out into the New England Gondwana wilderness areas. And when we do that, because we're going to do that, we're going to make that happen, that delivers us a much safer and an incredibly enriched future because these forests are our all, we are here for it, and we're going to give it all a future together. Thank you.